Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am Tamara Johnson Sheely. Good morning. It's Friday, September the 20th. It's a beautiful, oh, beautiful day here in Atlanta, Georgia. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's see where my trusty co host is. Let's see where he is. Mr. David. Hi, David. Hi, good morning, Tamara. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. It's a beautiful day outside. I know. It's, can yeah. you feel the crispness, though, in the air in the morning? It's like, oh, fall is almost here. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, let's get this party started. <laughs> I don't know if it's a party for you, David, since we can't have parties with you. You were crabby this morning. Yeah. But but okay. <laughs> so we have a guest this morning. We're going to talk about what it means to be an independent here in the state of Georgia. So hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties. We've been having some craziness with this broadcast. So let's hope we don't. If we do, we're going to get her on the phone line and we'll just have a uh, audio with her. So let's see if we can bring her into the broadcast this morning. <coughs> Luann. <coughs> Can you hear us, Luann? She's having some issues. It never, you know what, David, this broadcast, I swear. Luann, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Are you there, Tamara? No. So we're going to, we're going to. can't hear you. Yes, we're here. You cannot hear me, David. Can, you, can she hear you? See you. Oh no, that's not bad. That's not good. <laughs> so Luann, we're going to dial you into the broadcast this morning. We're going to make this as easy as possible. Um, David? Yeah. Being an independent here in Georgia, you see these U.S. Senate races, everybody and their mom is trying to jump in, but they're either Democrats or they're Republicans. Can you imagine if we had an independent in that race? Well, the the um, uh, trying to run as an independent from what from what I remember from the Green Party, trying to run as a third party candidate is almost impossible in Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, the the um, state rules about elections make it. You, I think you have to get um, uh, petitions from every county in the state or three quarters of them. I mean, it's really really difficult uh, to run a statewide campaign here in Georgia. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how it works for people who don't declare a party, but I would imagine that it's pretty much the same. So you have this duopoly locked in. That makes things very, very difficult. But let's hear from her and see what, uh, what she says. So we're going to bring Lu Luann Luann on the line because we're having all kinds of technical difficulties this morning. But Luann, can you hear? I'm hearing what they're saying. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's just have you on audio this morning, David. Can you hear Luann? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, yeah. Luann. We were talking about being the independent here in Georgia. Can you share what that whole process is? Okay. Go ahead. You're live, Luann. Everybody's listening. I'm live. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this, Tamara. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When, you know, we have, you know, people have to pick parties here in Georgia, either you're Democrat or you're Republican. But talk to us about what it means to be an independent. Right. Well, some of us never pick Democrat or Republican. We simply have no choice but to vote for them. Um, anyway, I, I'm ready to see some independents actually get on the ballot. Uh, it's, it's, you know, everything in America takes a while, but the, the laws in Georgia have been in, in place since 1943. So, you know, it's, it's a Jim Crow era law, and it's just time to, to undo it. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're trying to do that through the legislature, which you have to, um, you have to use the legislature to change the codes. Uh, we had no success in any year recently. Um, so this year, we are working with the Secretary of State to at least improve the petition form um, and hopefully give some more direction to people that are um, participating in the petition process. It's, it's very, uh, it's kind of tricky, let's put it that way. 
So was David correct, though, in his assessment that you have to have so many signatures per county, per yes. how does this all for work every, for, for every race? For how every, does this work mm -hmm. for every seat, for every office? Uh, it's five percent of registered voters. So um, just to give you an example here of a few, for, uh, for instance, I was in District 49, which is Alpharetta. That's a House district a or, a, or a state Senate district for a house. Uh, for a state house seat, mm -hmm. and I required 1,635 signatures, of which I managed to collect about 504. Now, let's say that I had uh, decided to run um, against uh, Karen Handel at the time for the um, congressional seat. Mm -hmm. Now that would require 5% of registered voters and I would have had to collect 20,988 signatures. No one has ever succeeded in getting on the ballot for a congressional seat as an independent in Georgia. Mm, that's a lot of signatures. And then I'm sure there's probably gonna be some discrepancies. Like if somebody has it's written their name and you can't read it or you know, oh, lots of discrepancies. Yes. In fact, I have here a little sheet that I received from um, the Secretary of State this year. And I believe these numbers were calculated for a Green Party lawsuit. Mm. So in uh, 2018, of course, we know the 2018 numbers because I was tracking them. But you, there were very, there's very little information in any year prior to that. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, I have uh, one man, uh, William Bozarth, in 2014 from District 54, House District 54, which I believe is near Buckhead. Mm -hmm. um, he, he needed 1,777. He managed to collect 2,282, and uh, 2,055 were valid. Now, what? in another case for a libertarian in 2014, Jeffrey Amazon, he needed 1,613. Mm -hmm. He collected 2,680, but only, well, 1,827 were uh, valid. So see how many you lose there? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can lose almost a third of what you've collected. And in fact, here's another good example from 2014. Mary Ward Cater, District, um, a House District 39, which I'm afraid I don't know where that is. But anyway, she needed 1,388 signatures. She collected 1,726, plenty of signatures. And I cannot tell you how many man hours that took. But then she only had 775 verified. Wow. So they so so do they actually go back and look at are these actual voters in your district? And it, and are these their sign and, and do they even have our signatures on file to even say this is my signature and I live in this district? Well, certainly they they say they do. And um they certainly go back and really nitpick it. It's not like they're just giving anyone any credit for you know, the process of collecting. And the truth is, again, this is a 76-year-old law. Um, there were many, many years where they didn't even verify the signatures. If you brought them in, you, you managed to appear on the ballot. But now we nitpick through them. And uh, you know, I would say with the numbers that we're looking at, they really, really nitpick them. For instance, uh, last year, or in, I'm sorry, in 2018, uh, a man named Femi Odewal collected um, 1,793 signatures completely on his own. He needed 1,698, but only 1,043 were verified. And he, he collected these signatures door to door using the voter roll. When you uh, sign up as an independent or a minor party for $50, you can purchase the voter roll. Now, you know, if you're going house to house using the voter roll, I just, you know, I don't understand how we're missing so much. 
um, again, it's probably um, illegible. They can't read it. Mm -hmm. People leave off information. Anyway, it's it's. Well, what if you're in a hurry and you just it. you just scribble your name like you're not your signature is not is you know you know may not totally match. I wonder if they're throwing signatures throwing uh, throwing those names off the the. That is right. Not only that, you're you're generally standing when you're filling it out. You sometimes have shopping bags in your hands, and you know it's it's uh it, it, it they make it quite hard to be honest. So. Uh, anyway, what can we do? How can we we change this without going through the legislature? We've we've designed a new form that uh, gives it a a lot more space for um, information. Let's see if you can see this. Doesn't look like much, but uh, we're eliminating some columns and uh, just you know overall adding more space to the signature and information plus we're adding the signature last because generally when you're filling out a form you print all your information and then you sign it so hopefully i remember in my own case having people sign and walk away because that's all they thought they had to do was sign because that was the first thing on the other page that you do now we're making it the last thing on the page so hopefully we'll uh get some more information so they've been really receptive to the to the modifying of this form they that has not been an, an obstacle or or obviously hadn't been something that needed to go through the legislature to get done well again chris harvey he's our elections director and uh, of course you know at the beginning of the year when we were trying to get the laws changed you know they basically said you know let's see what we can do without the legislature so that's uh, basically what we've been working on this year. Um, my suggestions were um, a few things like uh, a, I need a um, public service announcement when it's time for independents to begin collecting signatures. Um, he is, he will make the decision on the changes to the petition form himself even though it, of course, will also go to Brad Raffensperger. Uh, so again, we, there are things that they can do uh, at the Secretary of State's office, including this manual. I'm trying to uh, create a little manual for people because when you start, it's just, you know, you're just sort of- My wrong. thing is why, why are you as a, as a citizen creating a manual for the Secretary of State? Why aren't they saying, here you oh, go. I know, but I know my, my point is why haven't they said, this is our process to run as an independent here in Georgia. Here's your manual, here's your guide. They would, they should be offering you something. Yes, oh, I agree. The, again, if we're going to be extremely uh, particular about verifying the signatures, then we, they need to be just as particular about informing people how to go about collecting these signatures. And again, my manual is four pages long, so it's not like it's an extremely, um, you know, ridiculous request. But, you know, certain things like uh, no soliciting, that doesn't apply to uh, political candidates collecting um, signatures. Now, you see, most people don't know that. And at the entrance to most neighborhoods, there are huge no soliciting signs. So, you know, that intimidates people away. Um, again, the active voter list you can purchase. Um, to, to collect at a real estate development, you have to get their permission. Now, boy, that was a tough process. Um, I think I ended up making 32 phone calls to you know various uh, shopping centers with grocery stores around Alpharetta, and I ended up getting permission from one, one out of 12 real estate development, including North Point Mall, which said no. Uh, but, you know, that could have been a game changer for someone. You know, you don't have to worry about the weather. You, lots of, most everybody there is in your district. Anyway, the, the point is you have to get permission there. Uh, libraries, parks, post offices, you're not allowed public sidewalks that are possibly are in front of these libraries or parks or post offices. 
So, um, so it just seems it would be it's, it would make more sense. I would be afraid to go to these public places because it's like if you know you need specific signatures, like I need Jane Smith at this address. I would be afraid to just go out and be like, do you live in my district and trust that this person does or doesn't? Well, again, even whether you use the voter roll or not, we seem to be having that problem. You would think that everyone would be verified, but they're not. So so what I found, basically, and one of the reasons I, I, I signed up for this was to see a reasonable, how much time it takes to collect these signatures. So that, you know, what would be a reasonable amount of time to ask a candidate to put into this nomination petition? I worked about... Uh, six hours a week on it, um, going basically to downtown Alpharetta, parking my car in a primo parking spot, which the vendors really don't like, uh, putting my my uh, district map on the windshield of my car, and at at farmers markets, public events, you're you're certainly welcome to go. A public sidewalk, you're okay. But anyway, I could collect 45 signatures in a couple of hours at the farmer's market. Now, how many of them were actually registered voters? You just don't really know. But going door to door, I averaged one signature an hour. So that gives you an idea of how many, how much man hours will go into it. Because a lot of people may not be home and it's just, you know, they're not home. They don't answer the door. They say no. I mean, <laughs> overall, the petition process is, is really a positive um, experience. It really is. Uh, most days you come home, you know, thinking, what a great day. You get to talk to people. You get to hear ideas. But um, it's, it is a lot of man hours. So uh, be prepared for that. But the, But the other point is, we shouldn't have to, you know, be begging, you know, for the right to appear on the ballot and quite, you know, we shouldn't require quite this much work. Um, I would love to see all candidates required to collect um, a smaller amount of signatures, say 100. But um, unfortunately, the Republicans and the Democrats, which is a question I received so often, how many how many signatures do the Democrats have to collect or the Republicans? And the answer is zero in Georgia. You just sign up and you're on the ballot. You just pay your money okay. and, and sign. Yeah, you're right. Just pay your money and you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. That's exactly right. And of course, independents are paying our money, too. We just then have to go out and collect all these signatures. Yeah, but the Democrats and Repu the those state races, like I want to say it was like 400 bucks at least. Yeah, it was $400, 5000 to run for um, a congressional seat. So how much is so, it for a state, know, uh, that U.S. Senate seat, if somebody wanted to run as an independent? It's probably at least, if it's the congressional seat, is five. 5000 Plus, really, it was like 5000 a little bit more. But, of course, you know, a lot of people might can come up with 5000 but try coming up with 20,988 valid signatures. Mm -hmm. So far, it has not happened in Georgia. We've mm -hmm. had zero independents make, make that um, goal. Yeah. Now, you know, I'm looking here at uh, an independent who ran um, for a CD county, I think that's a CD4 in 2016, Hyan Nguyen, it says. And this man needed 19,401 signatures. He apparently provided 25,377 signatures, and only 528 of them were valid. Now, what are you supposed to make of that? Wow. Wow. David. So I don't I really, that yeah. one sounds bizarre. But, but again, we don't have the, we don't have a lot of uh, data on this. We need to, I would like to go back and, and uh, look at many, many more years, including going way, way back. This is a 76-year-old law. I'd like to see how they handled it in the 50s or the 60s. 
right. uh, the 70s. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Luann, what do you think uh, is the uh, um, overall consequence of the of of this of making it so hard to run as a as an independent? I mean, what do you see from the kind of lo- uh, long range and broader perspective? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it, the, there are certain things that you know that come to mind, but um, uh, uh, what does it mean to have it so difficult to be? A, uh, uh, t- to run outside the two-party system. Can you yeah. hear him? Can you, can you, did you hear his question, Luann? Yes, and the end. Well, of course, you know, in 1943, they, they created this law to keep the communists off the ballot, uh-huh. which huh. in itself oh. is a kind of un-American. <laughs> but, um, it's just, I can't really explain it, but this is why in my 58 years, I've never had the opportunity to vote for an independent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Georgia is, you know, a strange beast. And, you know, you, I, I, I really consider myself um, very much so, I'm a Democrat, but I'm, ve- I'm very much so independent thinking. Um, and I would, I, you know, running as an independent, if, if I could, I, I probably would, <laughs> honestly. Um, so yeah. Georgia is, you know, it's just a difficult place politically to, to really make a mark. And I, and I know it firsthand. Yeah. Well, the truth is, though, we're, we're having, you know, two party wars at the moment. And of course, it's gotten so much worse in the last 20 years. 22 years mm-hmm. since, uh, or really 87, since we lost the Fairness Doctrine. And then, you know, the TV station started coming after that. Um, I think some independents, if we can get on the ballot, if we can get elected, are going to sort of help calm the waters, you know, a bit. Um, and in 30 years, we could, you know, we could really have a nice, uh, the, neither party could, could, you know, have such a monopoly over any mm-hmm. state. Mm-hmm. And I don't think most people are one, you know, I think most people have a little bit of both of both parties. Like, I don't, I believe that I like doing business, you know, so a lot of the things that the Republicans talk about as far as doing business that in, in, I'm very much so interested. Um, so it's, I don't think most people are one way or the other. What do you think, David? Well, I was, I've been just kind of, kind of turning this over in my head a little bit. And one of the things that I, I think is, uh, 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 might be uh, 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 something to think about is that, um, is that having a two party system uh, really in the South, particularly, has really been a monopoly. It's been a one party system with a minority party that is in per, a permanent minority. And that was the case when the Democrats were the Dixiecrats, you know, and were the party of white supremacy. And uh, it is now the case with the Republicans who are the, the direct descendants of the Dixiecrats. But having a, um, having a system in which really there's a permanent minority is, is one of the things that I think is, uh, is really important about what, you know, what, what we see going on. Um, if there were more independent candidates, and uh, I tend to disagree with you, I think a lot of, a lot of people uh, who are not voting for the Republicans or Democrats are actually to the left of the Democrats. You know, um, it, independents are not simply people who are, you know, uh, between the Democrats and Republicans. Um, there are a lot of things in which uh, a lot of issues on which there are um, uh, people who are who are really uh, at least until this new crop of uh, you know of Democrats that has emerged from the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 uh, have been you know to the left of the centrist corporate uh, uh, Democrats, and those folks have been um, essentially housebroken. You know, they're they're people who are uh, willing to protect their seats in a minority, uh, you know, position 
rather than have their have them their um, uh, have themselves primary, let's say from the left. So I, I I think we really need to keep that in mind. Keep keep a consideration of that in mind. It's not just that there are people who are moderates who are in between the Republicans and Democrats. There are lots and lots of people who do not vote, who have not voted, who are to the left of the Democratic Party, and they have only been mobilized, uh, uh, and they're they're not fully mobilized yet. I mean, the you know the thing that Michael Moore says about uh, uh, about working people in this country and about uh, the the non the people who are not voting in elections. 70% of the electorate is women, people of color, and people under the age of 35, between 18 and 35. So, you know, when you when you think about that, um, um, uh, it really puts things in a very different perspective. Well, we have about, uh, about three more minutes with Luann. Luann, if someone is interested in running as an independent individual, and they're going to be as different as any individual. Um, but again, they, lots of people just don't join parties. I, it's never occurred to me to become a Democrat or a Republican because the parties change. And yet people don't seem to care. <laughs> they still are going to call themselves, you know, this or that. It's become like a religion, um, which <laughs> is just crazy. You know, we're supposed to be, a, you know, a secular society and um you know we've got this like a football team that's probably a better analogy a sports team uh which is a little you know it's just a little silly and it's really wasting a lot of time uh so again an independent you, they don't have a party to hide behind if they're crazy then they're going to be crazy on their own <laughs> and they don't they can't you know turn to their party to back them up or endorse them they're just going to be nuts and if they're nice and normal, and which most of us are, um, I, I emailed every single uh, candidate that was running for office in Georgia in a race to ask them about, you know, their status on independence for ballot access. And out of all those people, 180 districts, of course, in Georgia, this is another sad number, out of 180 districts, only 110 well, I'm sorry, 110 were unopposed. So that means not only did you not have two choices, <clears throat> I mean, you didn't even have two choices. Uh, but at any rate, the majority of them, I think I came across maybe four or five that I would have uh, considered, you know, really one way or the other, really far right or really far left. Most of them are just citizens. They're just people that, you know, think they might do a good job at holding a public office for a while. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think most of most of Americans are one way or the other. We're most of us very centered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, Luann. <laughs> David, I'm going to have to disagree that you, you think that most people are to the left, more to the left. I, I don't think so. I think most, most people... That's who we hear about. But um, most of us, I think, are really pretty far down, you know, right down the middle. Of course, look at, you know, the gun control issues. You know, 82% of Americans, that's that's not a left or right issue anymore. That's, you know, the majority of Americans are ready to do something. Um, also about minimum anyway, wage. Again, about? A lot of issues, Luann, that, uh, that uh, um, you know, that uh, American, you know, that the pu public opinion I would say is far to the left of the the um, uh, the two uh, parties, and and it's on the issues where, I mean, if you if you um, uh, uh, did public opinions polling in a way that would um, reflect, uh, you know, a different set of uh, of questions, like for instance, re redistributing the income and the wealth in this society, I bet you you would find really radical uh, p positions on the part of, uh, you know, of, a, of uh, a, a large majority of people, probably more than just the plurality. Um, so I, I and, and 
I think that the that what's happened is that the two party system has really become a way of preventing working class, uh, you know, interests from being uh, expressed in the political process. Uh, that was the case with the um, uh, with the uh, poll taxes. Uh, poll taxes were not only to exclude African Americans. Um, uh, they were to exclude poor whites. So, you know, uh, the, the, there were times in the, in the 1920s and into the 1930s when the New Deal was going on, when the Dixiecrats were being elected to Congress with 5,000 votes, whereas in California, it took 150,000 to, uh, to win an election. Now, when you're talking about that, you're talking about a completely unrepresentative system. So and the and and who voted in those elections was not you know working people not working people either either black black working people were completely eliminated they could not register to vote white working people could register but they couldn't pay the poll tax unless they were um, loyal to these uh, these dynasties that got set up in the in, in the south. The Russells and the Longs and the uh, Eastlands and all of these other other uh, people who essentially created two generation dynasties. Until okay, let's, before we go too far, I'm going to let Le Luann. I want to thank you, Luann, okay. for for being a. Well, you know, isn't that another party issue <laughs> again? Parties turn. Parties can go bad. Parties change, and uh, <clears throat> I don't necessarily want to join one. <laughs> And I shouldn't have to, yeah. but, but I still have the right to uh, vote for someone outside of those two parties. Yeah. Luan, I want to thank you for joining us on this broadcast. I am very interested in learning more about this whole independent process. Whatever kind of resource we can be to you here, our, uh, our door is open and you are a friend to this broadcast. So let's see what we can do thank to you. get more independence thank on you, the Tamara. ballot. I wanted to tell you, I, I tried to get some numbers for the 2020 elections coming mm -hmm. up, but they don't have any numbers ready yet for mm -hmm. any of the state or house districts. But um, I'm hoping, I know there's people out there thinking about it right now, just as I was t two years ago, looking into it. Um, I have just uh, changed the uh, name of my Facebook page to Independent Candidates of Georgia. So <clears throat> anyone that is interested in running as an independent, Please contact me. I want to be your, you know, advocate, your benefactor. I want to help you in any way possible, um, aside from going out and actually collecting signatures, because sadly that is going to be on you. But uh, there's there's lots of, of um, you know, little tricks that that I think we can, you know, help people figure out to make the process a lot easier. Say that name again. The Facebook page is say that name again, Luann. Independent Candidates of Georgia. Awesome. That's what it says. Awesome. So I'm hoping that, you know, once people signed up, and again, in 2018, we had 20 independents register, or qualify, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, out of those 20, 12 needed signatures. Mm -hmm. And one got on the ballot. Wow. A lot of work to do, yeah. but thank you for all you're doing. And please come back and let's continue to talk about this. Let's let's definitely make it a date to bring you back to talk about what it means to be an independent and, and talk to some of those candidates that have actually stepped up and said they want to be independent. So thank you, yeah. Luann. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Thank you have you. a good day. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, uh, nothing I was saying was uh, was to uh, 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 to. Uh, put a, 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 any opposition to Luann. Uh, I'm certainly think I'm that sure she didn't take it that way. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I really think that, uh, that having more independence on the ballot, whatever their, uh, uh, their, you know, their political position is, is going to loosen up uh, this um, um, rigid structure that we have in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and undemocratic as well. Yeah, so. he says, I'm interested in knowing how does either party benefit ADOS if none of the candidates from either the Republican or Democratic Party have a multi-trillion dollar reparation initiative for ADOS. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that's another that's another place way to the left that uh, that independent candidates could run on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the thing is that uh, that even if an independent candidate does not um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, get you know elected or get a majority support. Um, it pushes the candidates to address the issues. The mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the, the um, centrist party candidates, the Republican Democrats, to address those issues. And that's so, how I feel about Marianne Williamson and her candidacy. You know, I yeah. hope she can make it. I hope she makes it to the. I've heard that she might make it to the next Democratic debate stage. I'm, yeah. I'm hopeful, but you know what? If nothing else, we're going to get that message out. And guess what? Democrats and Republicans, if you don't have an ADOS agenda, an agenda specific to closing the racial wealth gap, an agenda specific to ma ending mass incarceration, and a, a, an agenda specific to some form of reparations, whether it's you cutting a check or you are creating uh, specific programs for ADOS, we, uh, that it will be an, an, uh, an agenda item. So you're right, David. I totally agree with you that this is how you push and this is how you make those candidates on the left and the right um, get on board with the with with the real issues. Yeah. And I and I want to emphasize again that a lot of the issues that are uh, uh, that are not addressed mm -hmm. uh, are coming out of the out of working class interests. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, that. Democrats have won elections um, in 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 northern states just on the basis of putting the uh, uh, the issue of a fifteen dollar minimum wage on the ballot, either as a, as a uh, uh, as a standalone you know um, uh, uh, what do you call it uh, uh, resolution or as part of the uh, as part of the agenda that brings out working class votes. And mm -hmm. makes it much more difficult for uh, the uh, what when that happens. It makes it much more difficult for state legislatures and for the federal government to pass tax breaks for the wealthy, for corporations to engage in the kind of anti-union, uh, uh, you know, anti-organizing legislation that they do. Um, so I think that there that that independence independent candidates are really, really critical for that, that whole uh, process. So mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Um, and, and, and I never, honestly, David, I hate party politics. I hate it. Like I really do. There is so, I found it is, is clickish, you know, it is divisive. Um, I, I never, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a part, I, 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 I attend the meet, have attended the meetings, but I, I never got too involved inside of the party because I saw all the, the friction. I saw all the infighting. I just saw all the backstab. And it's like, it's so, I, I like the independent platform. I understand that we are a two-party yeah. country, though. But our yeah. friend Egberto is in the house. Let's see where he is. Egberto is in the house. Egberto's <laughs> in the house. Hey, Egberto. How is are you down there? Y'all had some, oh, y'all had some rain. Uh, rain, I mean, we were flooded all over the place in uh, in Texas, man. Yeah. It's crazy, but you know, uh, this is the second time in less than four months <sighs> that this 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 town that I'm in, a whole lot of people got flooded out. Some people are just moving in now, and they got flooded out yesterday. Wow! Wow! wow. Yeah. And, but, and Houston, you're you're in Houston. For those of you that don't know, in the Houston yes. area. Yes, I'm in a place, a uh, suburbs called Kingwood. It's, uh, it's actually within the Houston city limits. And, you know, it's probably one of the, lately, it's been one of the places that's been flooding a whole lot. And mm -hmm. we, we have a feeling it has to do not only with construction, but we know the magic word nobody wants to hear. It's right. climate change. change. Because the amount of water that is falling, it's just astounding i mean we got 40 something inches of rain in a day in a, some parts of um this area 40 inches wait 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 say that again yes, 40 inches 40 50 inches of rain oh my God. over three feet of rain yes it is amazing people don't understand that the volume that we're talking about of rain when you talk that kind of a, um yeah that, that wow. it's crazy, you know. 
Alberto, um, it sounds to me like Houston is going to be climate refugees in another few years. You, you know, know? I mean, we really need to think about that. You know, that, that somehow we get this idea that this is all about Bangladesh, you know, or uh, or the Seychelles Islands or something like that. Um, it's going to be uninhabitable. There are going to be areas of Houston that that people are going to have to just leave. You know, did. You just gave me a talking point, brother. Absolutely. I didn't think about that. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's draw the connection between yes. the floods in the Northern Triangle and the floods in uh, uh, in Houston. We are all climate refugees. I you love know? that. Good day. That's a good observation, Dave. We got we to gotta kind of build up a blog on that one. I love that. I yeah. love that refugee concept, man. Well, you know, it, it, it really is, in some ways, it, it really makes no sense anymore um, to keep rebuilding in these areas uh, where, you know, where people are, are, getting, are getting flood insurance. You know, the federal, federal government flood insurance is is in it, I mean they I know they're shifting it now, but it's insane. You know, you yes. really have to uh, putting houses on stilts. Come on, you know, uh, we need to have these uh, these uh, wetland barriers uh, restored. We need to have all of this stuff, and we need to have people not build on the same place. I know it's terrible. It's terrible to think about dislocating hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, but uh, it, it's it you know unless you recognize that uh, that this is not uh, a uh, um, an, uh, this is normal this is the new normal right. It is in the past that's the kind. Of uh oh, did he freeze, David? Yeah, I see him frozen. Uh oh, Egberto, you're frozen. Can you, if you can hear us, yeah, he he frozen. Let's let's see. He'll, I'm sure he'll get back in. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. We're having some serious technical difficulties yeah. this morning, Egberto. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, you're good now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> good. Let, uh, you know, I I think uh, in in the old days with Galveston, uh, our government yeah. used to perform right. Galveston, when that big hurricane hit. They raised Galveston by several feet. They were proactive, understanding that those are things that could destroy the whole city. So they raised the whole city. You know, they, they, they pulled it all up. We don't have that kind of government right now that's proactive that says something is happening. OK, these homes are put together. If we really want to live there, we got to build it up or we got to do something. Nobody's thinking like that anymore. Infrastructures gone. But I, I, I know Tamara wants me here for some national stuff. Is that what, what I might I task to do, my friend? Yes, please. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I, but let me tell you what, what I, I had something else that I was going to talk about today. But then I turned on MSNBC and noticed that uh, the president is currently with the president of our prime minister of Australia. And it was so interesting what the press is doing. I honestly believe, and 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 I'd love y'all's opinion on this one. I'm not. I'm coming with an opinion, hoping to get a, a pushback. I think the plutocracy, that the press being controlled by who they are, are somehow attempting to prop up this president because they are of the ultimate belief that a progressive candidate is going to emerge out of the Democratic Party, and in doing so. Uh, they don't want a Democratic blood, a rather Republican bloodbath, and so they either want to mitigate, to to attenuate uh, the amount of Democrats that come to power, with the expectation that just maybe, you know, we really don't care if Trump gets reelected, because the reality is, uh, if we get these progressives in, the whole darn thing changed. This guy just got thirty minutes or more on MSNBC to completely lie about his record. Why would journalism put a president on TV without pushback, continuously lying about what he's done with the military, that he stopped ISIS, that he has the largest uh, economy? I mean, all these things, they're allowing him to say free of charge for 30 minutes on TV. 
I can't see how the fourth estate can do something like that. I think that they do that, Egberto, so that they can have more news. They have something else to talk about. Now, they've given him 30 minutes. They may talk about this for the next 30 days. Like all the things that he said wrong, why he, you know, was he lying? It, it becomes more stories. But there weren't even a pushback afterwards, you know, like they're discussing it right now. And the, the, the significant lies that he's told in that press conference are completely ignored. I think they don't care. They get ratings. I think they want those, those, you know, it's people are watching, they'll have sponsors, they'll make money. Right. Well, you know, reality TV. This time I, it's, like, it's like a reality TV, <laughs> like a yeah, show. I, I, I am of the feeling right now that, uh, that, that folks don't, oh, am I coming in with some echo today or? No, you're good now. You were earlier, but you're really good now. You're good. Okay, great, great. Um, yeah, I am really concerned about what's going on here. And I think the importance of having uh, some sort of independent media right now, it is so important because as it turns out, what we're seeing on, on, on TV uh, right now is just not, it, it's just not happening. I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that, David. Well, I'm, I, I'm not sure. I think it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, that, that the, um, what you you know what uh, the conspiracy theorists call the deep state, right? Um, I think there's a really uh, balancing act that they're trying to perform. I, I agree with you that uh, uh, that there is a real fear um, of the uh, of the uh, democratic left, uh, both small D and democratic party left. Um, uh, there's a real concern that there actually uh, uh, is going to be a mandate for a wealth redistribution in the, you know, in this country. And uh, uh, I, and yet at the same time, I think that they also see uh, that Trump is, is disrupting what in effect has been the, you know, the, uh, uh, the way in which the ruling elites have 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 governed for the last, you know, two hundred years. Mm -hmm. So and especially the last forty years. I mean, at least at, at least when progressivism came into play, I think it turned out that you know we were mitigating some of the the robber baron uh, era and all these other other things that have occurred. But now uh, I am not sure uh, when we have the former liberals, uh, the Gates and so forth. Uh, I, I think, I think capitalism is very corrupting. And, <laughs> you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and what I see, you know, even, even I see Gates taking sort of totalitarian positions when it comes to education. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I see Bezos taking monopolistic positions, uh, when I see those things, it's it sort of, I think it is, you know, you talk about them being scared of redistribution. I don't call it redistribution. I call it recapture, recapture of what was taken. Yeah. Yeah. I like that, Egberto. That's a good word. Recapture, not redistribution. I like right. it. it, it, it ha we, we have to start being honest with exactly what has occurred in the country mm -hmm. and, and start mitigating that. Yesterday, I, I gave a whole long rant as far as how corporations uh, uh what they what they do in in the form of misleading in fact even with the climate change here the rant was really based on all the uh all the suppression that the oil companies are doing on climate information that they've had for decades now and i propose something that uh you know some people don't quite agree with but i propose things like maybe it's time for 12 dollar gas you know gasoline which actually has the real cost of what it co you know the real cost of gas which means health care uh health care which is uh, uh a lot of people are unhealthy because of the burning of this particular product and also including uh go ahead i'm sorry you said 12 dollars gas i got stuck yeah <laughs> you're uh, trying to discourage people from using their cars and you want right. to get them onto mass trans transit is that what you're saying mass transit and and it, it, it like subsidize the electrical grid let me give an, another example right one of the things that i said is yeah let's have very expensive gas and use that all the money that that's collected from that 
to do things like solar panels on one's home. But people fear that not because of the word socialism. People fear that because at the point at, when you start to do that, it it turns out that the individual now becomes free. If you now have a uh, if you now have solar panels on your home and you're generating your own electricity and you are driving a subsidized electric car that can be charged from the, the from the energy that you produce on the roof of your home or inexpensively, suddenly we start to reframe power because power no longer resides in the oil companies. Power no longer resides in all these other other yeah. places because now you are all you know you are completely in control of well not completely in control but have a lot more control of what you're doing right now we are slaves to these particular corporations yeah yeah I think you're um, I think you're right about that uh, uh, I I think if there was a gradual phasing in right of that. Um, so that it did, the people could see that you know that solar generating of electric of electricity. I mean, I think you're right. It's 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 power in both senses of the word, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, it 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 really would have. Um, uh, it's the kind of thing that the Green New Deal program is uh, is really uh, attempting to introduce is to uh, decentralize how power that is you know electric you know right. is generated electricity is generated in the society um so that and and that's that's one aspect of it but you know uh Egberto, we have to think about the fact that there are whole industries in this in in the in the world and in this country who's who have perpetrated mass murder yes murder all right. I mean, what the what the oil companies did, um, you know, when they were researching in the 70s, researching the greenhouse gases, uh, they suppressed their own information. The Koch brothers put in hundreds of millions of dollars into into um, uh, distorting and suppressing the science. Uh, you have the tobacco industry, 400,000 deaths a year. Uh, that responsible for 400,000 deaths a year. Um, uh, we haven't. We, we we are just beginning to get to the opioid crisis, uh, which is the result of not just Purdue and the pharma and the Sackler family, but the whole distribution system of uh, you know of these four giant distribution companies. That's you know 20,000 people a year, 400,000 deaths in the last dozen years or so. And on top of that, we haven't even gotten to the food supply. The whole food supply in this country has been ha has been essentially out there to force feed force feed cattle and hogs and chickens so that they we could force feed human beings. I mean, the human beings in this in this country are being force fed on a diet of high fructose corn syrup, right. which is chemical. It's not, it's not sugar. It's a chemical, all right? If, uh, I know something about the process uh, because, uh, but anyway. The, it's amazing they, because I, I think, I, I, we always talk about narrative being important, right? Yeah. When we talk about that black kid in, uh, in, in Jersey trying to make a few dollars by selling, uh, selling marijuana, uh, it, it, the, the way he's displayed as this thug who is trying to sell dope to yeah. your mm -hmm. brother or your sister. But when Big Pharma sells opioids that's killing marijuana, I don't know of anybody who has died from marijuana. <laughs> I think so, okay? But when we talk about Big Pharma, white guys in a nice, beautiful three piece suit. Well, three, I'm, I'm old, so two piece yeah. suit, whatever, you know, nice in a, in a suit. In a high rise yeah. corporate building, right? In a, in a high rise air condition, having their pushers wear suits in drug stores and, and so forth, because that's what they are, right? Pushers, mm -hmm. the doctors are pushers. Somehow that has a little bit more class. I've always said, what America knows how to do is, you called it mass murder. I think I'm gonna start using that term as well. But what I find that America is very good at is doing all these bad things with class. 
And if you can do it with class and you can look good doing it in a suit, you can, you can annihilate all the natives in the world and still call yourself, I am the moral superior to other countries. You can enslave people and you are the moral superior to other countries. You can go ahead and build a Pacific Railroad with Chinese labor, forced labor, but you are the moral compass of the world. And you do it Preach, because Egberto. <laughs> you do it with class, you know. You, you you're doing it with class. We have to learn how to start breaking that mantra. When you talk about corporations equating with mass murder, David, that is magic. We have to start making those correlations because until we take the common person that's listening to us here and make those types of correlation. Uh, you know, when 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 Tamara uses it, even though I don't agree with her on ADOS, when she uses, wait, when she, no, but I, I, I'm, giving her, I, I'm giving her a great plug here. When she uses about, we are not going to be any longer there to protect you when you don't, when you're not there for us. When we start using those types of narratives, I think is where uh, we are going to be the most effective. And, and I think that is why we are what we are doing with independent type media that has no boundaries in other words you could never say these things on msnbc i think that is where the difference is going to come and with that i'll shut up and you can find this man every day monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday youtube instagram periscope facebook this man is everywhere politics done right egberto willies did his thing today thank you sir Thank you very much for having me. I, I love the show and keep up doing the great work you guys are doing. You too. Thanks Thank you, Egberto. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Keep dry. <laughs> I know, right? I think the rain yeah. has stopped prayerfully. I hope so. But oh my gosh, we've had a great broadcast today. Dave. We have about two more minutes left. You have some, you have one question. I don't want you to go, dive in too deep, but I'm going to put it on the screen. That have, he says, I have a question for David. Why is there a wide discussion about climate change in the broad sense? but dead silence on the toxicity that plagues ADOS ghettos due to being redlined in close proximity to toxic waste plants, being exposed to contaminated water, high levels of car and truck emissions and poor quality sewage, et cetera. Yeah, that's a good, uh, I mean, I'm not, look, a, a lot of climate justice issues um, are being raised, uh, you know, on the, uh, you know, by independent grassroots movements all over the country have been raising them. Um, and it is beginning to enter into, I mean, certainly it's a, it's an essential part of the green new deal. Um, I think that, that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, I mean, I, I think that, that almost everybody has, uh, you know, that is in support of the green new deal has put forward this uh, this question of environmental justice and equality. Mm -hmm. So I th I I'm 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 a little bit going to push back on that that it's that it's not been raised. Um, so that that's one thing. But I I think we one of the things we really need to think about is uh, is where does the where does the support for climate denial come from? It isn't just that uh, that these big oil companies have uh, who is who is it that that actually supports what's going on um, uh, that does not want to think about climate and, uh, and and the issues around it and I would say that the grounding for this goes back to the GI Bill and to the creation of segregated white by design suburbs which created the car culture. That uh, that exists in the and the single family homes, all of which is based on 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 uh, uh, petroleum. So we're really we really need to look at at race and racial inequality in the broader picture, not just the fact that uh, that that communities of color are targeted and dumped on, on you know with uh, with toxic waste, but also why there are there are these areas that are. Uh, uh, that is, you know, these suburban areas that have been, you know, able to become, remain relatively pristine. Mm -hmm. 
And so if- we don't want to get too far into that, David. We're at the top of the hour, mm-hmm. but I just want to say this was a great broadcast. I want to thank Miss Luann for coming on and, and filling right. us in on what it means to be independent here in Georgia and the process, David. Oh my gosh, is a, yeah. a lot to a lot of work that needs to be done there. Thank so you. Ed- we continued on the on this uh, whole issue of uh, of the Green New Deal. There's a lot to be discussed about yeah. it. So. Yeah. We got to definitely keep unpacking that. But next week, David, uh, I may be at a conference, but you will have a co-host. Uh, I am uh, the Emory's having a NATO conference that I am very interested in learning more about. So you will have a, a trusty co-host that will sit in. And then the following week, I will be. October 4th. No, that's next. That's that's the 27th. Uh, I'm going to the conference. That's one conference. October 4th. I may uh, I will be in Kentucky at the ADOS conference and I will be broadcasting live from there at some point. But David will have a co-host with him on that day as well. So it'll be quite interesting. Y'all can have have your way with the broadcast. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, we'll talk about this, uh, this whole thing about the the consequences of suburbanization and white by design, um, you know, expansion into this. Uh, into the areas that used to be farmland. Yeah, yeah. You can find David always right here on Facebook at Acknowledge the Divide. You can always find Mr. Egberto Willies on Politics Done Right right here on Facebook and every media social media platform. He's everywhere. I am Tamara Johnson Sheely. You can find me at TamaraForGeorgia.com. Be on the lookout. We're getting some all kinds of stuff is happening here this, with this broadcast. So just stay tuned. It's just getting better and better. And thank you, David, for thank a great you, broadcast. Yeah. Thank you. See you next week. Well, Power they'll see us people. next week. Power <laughs> to the people. <laughs>